Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast from the magazine that is not on your ballot this Tuesday, so you can't blame us. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, making weird guttural noises, uh. Peter Silverman, <laughs> and Catherine Mangu, giggling ward. How do you do, fellow citizens? Howdy. Uh, Matt, that was the worst intro Happy ever. Happy Midterm Madness Monday. Ooh, uh, a little alliteration to start out our week. Let's get straight to it. Uh, the uh, fate of democracy is in your hands. President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. said yesterday, uh, warned MSNBC historian Michael Beschloss, what's at stake is whether we will be a democracy in the future, whether our children will be arrested and conceivably killed. Uh, counters uh, Carl Rove, the Republican strategist formerly known as Bush's brain. The geniuses in the West Wing thought they could make the election about anything they wanted it to be about. A midterm election in particular is about what the people want it to be about. Deep thoughts from Carl Rove. So in Republicans reading, the election is about crime. It's about inflation. It's about the economy. It's about COVID. Uh, it's about immigration. Immigration. Yeah, thank you. Jesus Christ, he's interrupting the word on my page. I thought, you, I, I thought this was participatory. No. It's not masturbatory, no. okay? The, get to the get question. The Come on. Get the electrodes back on, the testicles. Uh, whatever it is. They were never off. It's they were never close, off. this election. Control of the United States Senate hangs in the balance. There's a pretty normal pendulum swing looking uh, like it's about to happen in the House. Remember that on average, something like 26 uh, 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 president's party loses about 26 seats in the first midterm. But also the chances of a uh, uh, pre-election polling error is particularly high because the kids don't answer their phones. And I can't really blame them. Uh, libertarians, as usual, are outsiders much more so now than ever before. And perhaps we can add a useful uh, outside perspective that the currently hyper panicked insiders are unable to achieve so catherine um as a non-voting anarchist one-legged robot uh can you lead us in a round of everyone giving their sense of what is the single biggest important thing from your perspective at stake in this election to end all elections yeah i heard this was the most important election of our lifetimes matt so you okay. know okay so why? Because they all are. Every single one is. Every single one of my lifetime has been the most important election of my lifetime. Uh, this one, you know, obviously the rhetoric around it is, you know, where democracy is at stake. But it's not clear in that kind of um, hysteria whether the outcome of the election is determining whether we get to keep having democracy or whether the conduct during the you know, election day and vote counting is the thing that we have to keep an eye on. Probably both, I guess, everything because everyone's just losing their minds. I have historically been a skeptic of the uh, often espoused libertarian position that divided government is good government. I think that, um, you know, there maybe I'm an idiot, but I just keep holding out hope that some kind of minimally competent and minimally you know, libertarian friendly government would still be better than just a, a gridlocked nightmare scape. I am I'm coming over, though, to the side of team divided government. And so I think, you know, that's that's what's at stake here. If we end up with um, kind of meaningfully, you know, a, a government meaningfully at odds with itself in terms of the partisan balance, that we will at the very least not have to see a replay of the of the, the sort of inter interdemocratic nightmare where like Joe Manchin, you know, ran the country for a year. And instead, we will see kind of a more classic tension between the parties resulting in very little getting done. Um, at this point, I really can't see anything that anyone in government is proposing to do that I want to see done. Um, and so uh, we might as well just have gridlock. Wait, you're not excited about Peter. the debt limit showdown over Medicare and Social Security? That's definitely going to happen. Peter, don't you yeah. start with me. I, th I think, <laughs> I think that debt we may... limit showdown, though, that's like Spider-Man 3 or something. Yeah, it's somebody play the be Bonanza it's... theme. Peter, what's your uh, uh, single biggest issue of importance that, that's at stake in this election, I think, according to I you. think this is, this election is mostly about inflation. Not entirely, but mostly in some ways because inflation supersedes and also encapsulates all other issues, right? Like 
there's a if you look at the surveys and also just the reports anecdata from voters they'll be like well you know democracy abortion sure all that stuff it's like seems important but what actually matters is when i go to the grocery store things are much more expensive and the partisan polling is i think pretty revealing here republicans have been worried about inflation for a while they're they're quite worried about it for obvious reasons in part because it hurts their pocketbooks in part because it's like a it's a a way of scoring points against democrats uh, against joe biden right um but Democrats and upper middle class voters in recent months have actually grown more concerned about inflation rather than less. And so even Democrats are trending in a, a direction that is bad for Joe Biden and his party. Um, and independent voters, uh, who are obviously very important to elections and the outcomes of elections, independent voters are actually more likely than Democrats or Republicans to say inflation is creating serious stress in their lives, according to a new Wall Street Journal poll. So that's what people are worried about. Then that tells you about what the what this election, I think, is really going to be about. And what's it's amazing to me is the way that Biden and his party have responded by trying to treat this as a messaging problem, which is in some ways, this is what Democrats and to a lesser extent to or in a different way, maybe Republicans always try to do with problems they can't really solve. But the macro economy does not respond to speeches like you can't. Really? You can't you can't fix it with soaring rhetoric. It just doesn't care how many times Joe Biden says, come on, man, or, you know, insists <laughs> that like is that that malarkey. Passes for that, soaring like, rhetoric he, now? The democracy needed, is on the he needed to bring uh, the malarkey. Right, it's, right, inflation, it. it's like the Terminator. It's out there. You know, it can't be bargained with. It can't be reasoned with. It doesn't feel pity or remorse. It will absolutely not stop ever until prices stop rising. I think is how that goes. And I just think Democrats have have not even bothered to reckon with this in a really serious way, um, in part because to do so would be to acknowledge that Joe Biden's big signature policy when he came in to office uh, was to pass a giant spending bill that even people in his own party said was too big and was likely to trigger runaway inflation. Um, Democrats went ahead and did it. They did it on a partisan basis. And now we are where we are. Uh, you know, uh, Peter, uh, Joy Reid, Joanne Reid from MSNBC taught me that um, no one had used used the word inflation until Republicans in the scaremongering media started using it. So I think you're part of the problem. Uh, Nick, what is uh, your sense of what is at stake for Nick Gillespie? I, I was going to also add to Peter, though, that, uh, that you know, the Stacey Abrams at one point tried to wrap abortion into inflation. And it was something like, you know, because now we can't get abortions, inflation is really out of control or something. And um, so, you know, I you got to give people think points. the price of a terminated pregnancy is included in any measure of CPI. No, but think of the, the spending that you commit to if you let that kid come, you know, to term. That's like, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. You are just you're pouring gas on the economy of the future. Matt, I uh, to pick up on uh, actually what both Catherine and Peter were saying, I think the you know, it's it's the economy in the broadest terms possible. And it's not simply inflation. Um, I think it, you know, there is a restructuring going on um, that has been going on for the past 20 years. You've talked about it. Uh, recently on this podcast about, you know, the labor force participation rate, younger people, older people, like who who's in the economy, who isn't um, on, t you know, and then you see things like inflation and you see things like free trade and supply chain, you know, problems where most people don't really fully understand why this is. Ha I don't know that anybody really fully understands why any of this is happening, but there is a growing sense that things are just not being taken care of or acknowledged or nobody knows what's going on. And then you look to the people who head up, you know, the two big parties and it's Joe Biden on one hand, who is a bumbling fool. And I was talking with a bunch of Democrat operatives, you know, I'm not talking about just regular voters or anything. And they like, they do not have a sense of how badly Joe Biden comes off to everyone in America, except that. I mean, he is fucking out of it. And people, everybody knows that. And then there's Donald Trump. And, you know, I'm sure we've all had, you know, either, uh, you know, people who are Trump tards or friends who are like, well, he's not so bad. And it's like this guy, these are these are the two heads of the parties and they're poisonous people. 
that nobody believes, nobody trusts. Um, and that's really what's at, at stake here. It's certainly not democracy. And, um, you know, for that reason, I think we are going to see a swing to the Republicans because they are not the Democrats, first and foremost. And this election is going to be like most of the elections of the past 20 years now, where it's like whoever is in, in power needs to be taken out of power. Uh, and then it takes about two years to realize that the people that we just voted in are just as bad. They might even be worse because they have been living in basements, you know, scraping paint chips off of, uh, you know, cellar walls and eating those in the two years that they're out of power. So uh, my sense of the biggest thing um, uh, at stake for me, for Matt Welch, uh, is that on the ballot in um, a handful of states, uh, Arizona, Michigan, Minnesota, Nevada, um, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, there are governors and or uh, secretaries of state. So people who are in position to impact the counting of votes who are not just people who have said, hey, you know, the 2020 election was rigged and whatnot, but they've been campaigning pretty openly on doing things to make sure that they don't steal the vote away from uh, Donald Trump next time around. When we talk about the institutions of democracy being under threat, um, it's not very helpful in my point of view to be vague about it, but the specific candidates are these people. Uh, many of them are in a position, uh, uh, they have a good puncher's chance of winning. And at least one of them, Carrie Lake in Arizona, was boosted by Democrats. Nice job in the primary because they thought that she'd be easier to beat. Uh, those are the races that I will be watching soon. We have talked a little bit about it already, but let's get more into it. Uh, what is the one main major party closing argument that you find most risable bonus points if you get uh, making whoopee in your answer Catherine, why don't you start i will not be getting making whoopee in my answer just want to clear that up right now uh, you know it's a great I, sports I, team from macon georgia i think um it's what i alluded to before which is that the the closing argument of democrats seems to be if you let republicans take control of one or more houses of Congress, democracy as we know, or maybe one or more state legislatures or governor's mansions, democracy as we know it will be over. And that is not true. That is untrue. Bill Maher uh, says it's true, Catherine. Bill Maher is wrong in this respect because it's, you know, we have a great uh, cover story from a couple of issues ago by Eric Bame, which I recommend to you, about how uh, our elections have always been messy. And we are in a messier than usual moment. Like, I don't mean to say everything is completely fine. Um, and there really are some battles happening for control of kind of specific semi-obscure bureaucratic entities that control how election outcomes get communicated and tallied that I think are worth paying attention to. But broadly speaking, our democracy will be fine. And certainly this midterm election is not is not the linchpin of history. So I guess I'm just back to my very, very beginning of my first answer, which is, you know, is this the most important election of our lifetimes? No, it's not. It's an election. It's a regular election. And some people are being kind of extra bonus dickish. Um, but that is neither here nor okay, there. Okay, but if you're like democracy 18 months old. This is the only election <laughs> of your lifetime. You know, you got me there. That's a that's a fact check on it's me, the, and I will the concede the point. Baby boom, right? We got the, the, like there's at least four reason staffers with uh, with uh, offspring who, who are 18 months old. Are you saying that was just pandemic related? Yeah. No, I thought you were going to say there are at least at least uh, four reason staffers for whom this is the first election of their lifetimes. We got some some uh, youths on the staff I mean, now. Certainly, Billy Binion looks like that. Uh, Peter, what? What is the major party uh, closing argument that uh, is sticking in your craw, whatever a craw is? It's a synthesis of what you talked about with the Republican um, races where there are governors, et cetera, who are promising to install people or sort of change processes uh, in order to ensure that Donald Trump wins next time, even if he doesn't win, I, I think is kind of the argument there. Um, 
right? So even if he the, doesn't the run, Trump MAGA yeah. stop the steal movement. I think on the one hand, and the flip side of that, which is what Catherine has uh, you know mentioned, which is the Democratic argument that democracy is in peril. And so I think Republicans are in a really disturbing place with when it comes to the machinations of democracy and voting and whether or not Trump actually won in 2020. Trump Trump lost, and a lot of Republicans have not accepted that, and they need to, and they've built a movement around the idea that actually he did, and it's just totally out of touch with reality, and I think it's really poisonous for our politics. At the same time, Democrats have responded with this argument that therefore, democracy is in peril, and you, 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 what, and the, the implication of their argument, of the democracy is in peril argument, is that you then have no choice but to vote for Democrats. And not just no choice but to vote for Democrats, no choice but to vote for Democrats and enthusiastically support their entire stupid policy agenda, the one that landed us within the place we are right now economically, the the one that you know like that we have seen for the last two years from Dem from Joe Biden, a Democratic in the White House, and a unified Democratic Party in Congress, and. Josh Barrow, um, who is you know not a libertarian, not and sort of a, an interesting center left guy, recently wrote a, a really smart piece in which he basically argued that if you're telling voters that democracy is in peril to the point where you don't have a choice but to vote for Democrats, then what you're telling them is you've already lost the choice and you've already lost democracy, and it's it's just a terrible argument from from like a kind of logical perspective, but also from a, I think even from a pro-democracy perspective, because what it says is, is that in fact, you don't have a choice, you shouldn't have a choice, and you've got to support all of our dumb spending stuff if you want to restore democracy. You've got to support all of our bad ideas, our entire you know, crappy policy agenda. Now, Republicans are responding with terrible non-policy ideas. I mean, if you look at, at the Republican policy agenda to the extent that it exists, it is in many ways, just it's it's half-assed and barely there, and so Republicans are not exactly you know on the ball about this stuff either. But the way that Democrats have responded to uh, Republican election nonsense is, I think, not particularly helpful, and it it has landed us in a really sort of unpleasant place going into this midterm election. I would remind everyone that um, the same people who are making the uh, democracy is dying in, in broad sunlight argument right now uh, tended to wildly mischaracterize the Georgia election law changes. Um, uh, not that long ago, uh, President Biden called it, you know, not just Jim Crow, but Jim Eagle. Um, at yeah, some Jim Eagle. <laughs> at some point, and uh, and this <laughs> doesn't that make it more <laughs> American? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it just well, gives me the it, it Jim shifts Henson. shifts the blame onto American Indians. I yeah. don't know. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought about that. No, it gives me the Jim Henson, Sam Eagle energy. That's mm. what I think of when I hear that. I'm trying to grow my eyebrows out just like that. Uh, Nick, I, I know you broadly agree with what Peter and Catherine both just said. I would invite you as you uh, expand on that to take into consideration that you know, in 2016 20, or 2015, you, we didn't think Donald Trump was going to win uh, in January, early January of 2021. We didn't think that the Capitol was going to get ransacked and that 140 Republicans would not vote to certify the election. Is it possible that the hysterics, hysterical though they may be, are causing us to underrate the possibilities for chicanery? Yes, I think so. I, I, def depending on how you define chicanery, there might be more things like the January 6 riots or something. But in terms of voting, I mean, you know, the elections have been really solid over the past, you know, 20 years. Like there aren't any, you know, everybody has gone looking for this. And unless you're Dinesh D'Souza, whose books keep getting pulped by publishers before they can see print. You know, like nobody has found wide scale, large scale voter fraud that matters in any given election. What we're seeing actually in this to build off of what uh, Catherine and Peter were talking about is like, we're not seeing the death of democracy in the 21st century. We are seeing the growth of it. Like, you know, uh, the voting eligible population, which is the number of people who are voting age who are actually able to vote in the 21st century has been like higher than it has been in the previous 50 years. In 2018, we had record midterm turnout. We're going to see that again or something like that. This is what democracy looks like, and it kind of sucks, <laughs> but it's not 
going away. I mean, like this is this is exactly I can remember writing for Reason in one of my first I think it was one of my first editorials as editor in chief of the magazine in 2000. People were bitching and moaning about the vanishing voter. People didn't vote enough. People didn't vote enough. And like we've had 22 years of people voting in record percentages in every election across the board, and it sucks. So if you want democracy, this is what it looks like, um, and it's not good. To go to your you know your earlier point, Matt, about like secretaries of states and people like Carrie Lake, who is out of touch with reality on many, many core issues, including whether or not Donald Trump was elected president in 2020 or not. I'm hopeful, uh, and this may be like totally, you know, just because there's nothing else to do but hope for the best. But in Boy Scouts, uh, you know, and I was an Eagle Scout, they, you know, one of the things they they, they taught us. Yeah, Joe Eagle, Jim Eagle Scout. Uh, But one of the things that the, uh, the leaders of the troop taught us was like, when you see a troublemaker, Give them some responsibility and it straightens them out. And how are secretaries of state like they have to oversee elections that are going to be closely watched, et cetera? Like it's going to be really hard for them to be in charge and throw elections one way or the other um, because there's so much scrutiny. And also the election results need to be believed in order for them to stand. So I'm less worried about this kind of broad based chicanery, although. I do think politicians, whether they're right wing or left wing, and there's some on both parts who are so blatantly out of touch with basic reality, should be called in on that all of the time. I feel like Uh, I just understood for the first time how Matt Welsh became editor in chief of Reason. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I also realized, like, after the fact, I was like, oh, that's why I was made a leader of the troop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's it's, it's just turtles all the way. Wheels here for sure. (laughs) Oh. OMG. Uh, I'm going to take as my entrance something that uh, Suderman alluded to before, which is a large Democratic Party closing argument. Um, as Joe Biden said about a thousand times in the last five days, Republicans have embraced a plan, embrace and plan. Those are key words here uh, to sunset Social Security, and Medicare within five years. They're going to put it on the chopping block. No, that's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It's important that that's not true. He's the president. He's saying the thing. It isn't true. There isn't a plan. There is one stupid Rick Scott bullet point list from February that includes 18 words in which some of it is that all federal programs should be sunset within five years. Um, doesn't say anything about Social Security, and Medicare um, in follow up questions in March of this year. Someone's like, oh, did you, did you mean Social Security, and Medicare? He's like, nope. Nobody I know wants to do that. So that's the plan that Republicans have have embraced, the plan that doesn't exist, um, that is not supported by anything that anyone is campaigning on at all right now. It, It hides the reality that the Republican Party of 2022 is basically unrecognizable when it comes to things like entitlement reform than it was in 2010 because Donald Trump won the argument against Paul Ryan. Where is Paul Ryan right now? He's crying in his money. That's where Paul Ryan is right now. He doesn't matter at all. Donald Trump does. Part of the reason why is because Trump said, I am going to protect your Social Security and Medicare. Screw these bean counter Republican conservatives. And now you have the rising class of Republicans who matter are saying stuff that like Blake Masters did about libertarianism, that it doesn't work. It sucks. Uh, and then he gets the endorsement from the libertarian. Can I vote, vote for him now that he is explicitly anti-libertarian <laughs> and I'm a libertarian? I mean, I, I mean, a lot of members of the Libertarian Party. It's right very there. attractive the, to the me. self-hatred of the yeah. yeah it's I think it's yeah. Got, work out. I think you got to go uh, move to Arizona first, or uh, uh, or at least uh, try to. Uh, Can I get a mule, some kind of mule that will take my vote there? Like a like an actual mammal or you I don't mean know. like a, I just know there's 2000 mules <laughs> and they're running votes hey, all over Matt, the place. Uh, there is hey, at Peter. least one other quasi not quite plan that suggests that Republicans might want to do something to Medicare and Social Security. It is uh the uh, it, it is the House Republican Study Committee's 122 page budget, which includes lines like adjust the Medicare eligibility age to reflect life expectancy. It's not a plan to sunset yeah. Medicare and Social Security in five That's, years. It sounds like exactly the same thing as sunsetting it's both sunsetting Medicare and shopping block. It's got some tables that show that if you don't do anything, Medicare's one of the big trust funds 
will not be able to pay all of its bills. Like if you, if you continue on just not doing anything and then it says, well, maybe we should do something. Right. Um, the, uh, so w- what's great about that is that the, um, uh, those proposals are basically with one exception, indistinguishable from the proposals that the, uh, uh, bipartisan Simpson Bowles uh, committee came up with in 2010, 11, uh, when uh, Barack Obama appointed a uh, uh, committee to look at long-term entitlement reform, because we're not going to kick that down the road, uh, not on my watch. We're going to finally like solve this problem. This was I remember that. Bro- broadly uh, understood by people who pretended, at least at seriousness, about long-term fiscal whatevers, um, that you had to make at least those small adjustments. The, other, the thing that the Republican Study Committee thing does that is uh, beyond where they went is that they wanted to give younger Um, workers the option to opt out of the Social Security retirement and and invest things on their own, which has been something that Republican or conservative white papers have been advocating for 50 years, and it goes precisely nowhere um, ever. Uh, The closest that we came to any of this, and Nick might remember this because he has memory cells, um, uh, is the uh, Ownership Society uh, uh, like flaccid attempt by George W. Bush in his second term that just sort of collapsed on almost on contact. Um, it's I not. Don't know. I mean, it obviously worst. didn't happen. But there, I actually think maybe I was just like a delusional youth at that time. But I remember following that conversation and thinking, okay, it seems like there is a a reasonable possibility that we will get nothing like actual privatization, nothing like you know something that solves our budget problems, but maybe. A little 401k ish account for some people, it could it could happen. Like, it was I crazy to think that like the Posen plan or whatever was was a, a potential reality in that moment. We already uh, have that though. You can re- you can voluntarily save for retirement. Uh, yeah, that's true. And tax advantage yes. accounts, but specifically, and, uh, that we you know, going to take su- some of some of the money out of Social yeah. Security as it's currently constructed and put into this, these other accounts. Now, I remember thinking at the time also. Those accounts will get ransacked when, uh, you know, the next moment that politicians want them. And also they'll be somehow constrained in ways that are damaging and, you know, ultimately don't serve uh, taxpayers. But was I crazy to think that might have happened at that moment? So George W. There's, Bush did, uh, in fact, yes. sign into law um, HSAs, the health savings accounts. But the, uh, if I recall correctly, that was at least somewhat linked to the um, a, a Medicare reform and expansion bill that uh, that ha- that uh, also established Medicare Part D. So he expanded Medicare yes. while also building HSAs into the system. Right. But then there was yeah. a Social Security um, equivalent of it. Yeah. That was after he was reelected and he, he, you know, he won big. He was the first president since his father to win with a majority of the popular vote. A mandate. And he said, I have a lot of, uh, you know, capital and I'm going to play it. And he, he went after immigration and social security. And within six to eight months, both of those, poly, you know, both of those plans were just totally gone. Reason had an interesting debate about privatizing social security between Tyler Cowen and James Glassman. People can look it up probably from 2004, 2005. Um, I think subsequent to the Obamacare uh, kind of arguments, it'll be interesting to see Republicans, I don't think, can do that if any kind of, you know, mandatory, any kind of privatization of retirement spending is based on involuntary contributions or that you have to sign up. That won't make sense anymore. All right. We're going to get, we're going to talk more midterms uh, uh, later, we're now going to get to our listener email of the week here in a moment. But first, look, we're all responsible adults here. We do what it takes to insure our families in case of medical emergency. But what many of us don't realize is that health insurance won't always cover the full cost of an emergency medical flight. Even comprehensive coverage can leave you with high deductibles and copays. That's where Air Med Care Network comes in. When you see when you sign up to become a, a member, should any such emergency arise, you will not see a bill for air medical transport when flown by an AMCN provider. Air MedCare flying machines transport more than 100,000 patients each year. Best of all, this peace of mind for your whole family can be yours, beginning at the low, low price of just $85 a year. Listeners to the roundtable can get gift cards for their new memberships for up to $50. Through their Visa or Amazon, simply visit airmedcarenetwork.com slash reason and use the offer code reason. Start protecting your family. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. 
All right. Reminder to send us your succinct emails to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Dave Matthew, no S, who writes in part, hello, roundtable. My pithy query is this. Do you think candidates would attract the 8 to 15 percent of independents? I presume this is Matt cutting in that that's the number that he's attaching to independents by refreshingly stating their actions in office will have little to no effect on individualized happiness. For example, Democrats and Republicans have squabbled over tax cuts, a somewhat nominal 39.6 percent to 37. 37% for the top rate, while federal spending on every single mandatory and discretionary program has remained relatively unscathed, yet the tax cuts are held up as an us versus them when discussing policy. Will cynicism ever prevail? Are there any real-life Bullworth examples? Now, for you 40-somethings on this podcast, Bullworth was a uh, late 1990s Warren Beatty picture in which a and Holly Berry, uh, and yes, a sleazebag uh, Democratic politician uh, organizes his own assassination. I think uh, he's like a senator, and then hours uh, he goes on a bender because uh, he's ha- unhappy and he smokes a lot of pot and gets super drunk, and then uh, shows up in public and starts rapping really badly about the reality of politics. And improbably, um, I think he might, was there a blackface? Uh, I'm not sure if there's actual blackface. No, no, no. Um, but he, he did wear a uh, skull cap. He wore a skull cap. Uh, he improbably starts betting Halle Berry, which is exciting for Warren Beatty. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, oh, and for her. Come uh, on. <laughs> he was Warren Beatty I, back then. He wasn't the desiccated corpse who misread the uh, winning picture a couple of years ago at the Academy. I heard Awards. betting just in like B-E-T-T instead of betting. And I was like, was there a poker game in which Halle Berry was wagered in this film? Like I essentially. Okay. But anyways, he started rapping the truth about how Democratic politicians are full of crap and him probably started getting super popular. Um, and so people thought, hey, maybe that's if they would just tell us honestly. So, Catherine, could the fantasy of having a politician uh, suddenly uh, become popular by telling the cynical truth about the limitation of politics and the cynicism of it um, uh, and then suddenly succeeding? Could that ever come true? I think that happens regularly. I think almost every time that we elect a celebrity um, to office, that's essentially what's happening, including perhaps the election of Donald Trump. I think many people who voted for him perceived him to be that guy. They perceived him to be someone who was just like, you know what? I am not beholden to the ritual of this thing. And I'm just going to say what I want to say. I think the the delusion that at least those of us of a libertarian persuasion have is that that character is somehow correlated in the end to doing anything even remotely good in office. And I think those things are unrelated. Uh, And that is what I have taken away, at least from not just Donald Trump, but actually the kind of populist, uh, the reactionary populism that's kind of cropped up around the world in the last four or five years. Um, People who seem like they are doing this, who seem like they are being Bullworth, I guess, on this day, like Ferris Bueller's political day off is what it sounds like you just described. You know, those people are subject to all of the same human vices as regular stuff shirt politicians and perhaps even more. Peter, this is an open invitation for you to uh, assess your own favorite or at least uh, favorite cinematic presidencies and or to rebut Catherine's assertion that uh, Trump equals Bullworth or Bullworth equals Trump. So I think the thing that people forget about Bullworth is that the most memorable rap couplets were actually about, I hate this about health policy. Yo, <laughs> oh, no. yo, everybody going to get sick someday, but nobody knows how they're going to pay. Healthcare, managed care, HMOs ain't going to work. No, sir, not those. Because the thing that's the same in every one of these is these mother effers there, the insurance companies, and then two characters named Cheryl and Tanya chant insurance insurance and he says yeah yeah you can call it single payer or canadian way only socialized medicine will ever save the day come on now let me hear that dirty word socialism socialism and honest and what you have to remember is what you have to remember i love it (laughs) what you have to remember is this movie came out in the late 1990s and that was not a reaction to 
Republicans trying to privatize whatever. That was a reaction to Hillary Care and to the mainstream Democratic Party's attempt to reform the healthcare system. It's also uh, worth pointing out that Warren Beatty, you know, cut his political teeth in the 1972 campaign of George McGovern, where he helped a war hero lose virtually every state in the country. <laughs> but I think you can draw a pretty direct line from Bullworth and its sort of um, from from that style of politics to Bernie Sanders and to the kind of progressive takeover or at least the rising progressive movement that we have seen post Obama in the Democratic Party, where they're like, well, if we just say that all these mainstream things, you know, uh, that that like we, we've tried before, if we just say that's, you know, that's bullshit, right? If we just call it out, then somehow or another will win. And it's it's a little I mean, it's related to what I was saying earlier about inflation, like the Democratic Party has decided that you can win all of these things just through a kind of blunt, you know, sort of we're just going to say the truth, man, messaging that I don't know if it exactly derives from Bullworth. It's not like Bullworth had, uh, you know, was the first popular incarnation of that idea. We've we've seen it for decades. At the same time, Bullworth was a was popular in certain circles, uh, developed a cult reputation, and Bullworth uh, it Bullworth plays at least some small role in putting us in the you know sort of. Um, in an America where Bernie Sanders isn't president, but play, but is surprisingly influential within the Democratic Party. So Bullworth is Trump. Go Although ahead. he really isn't. I mean, I think this is it's it's interesting. I, I, Peter, I think that's a really fascinating read. And it's really helpful to remember, you know, Bullworth's main thing was about health care in response to Hillary care. But ultimately, when you look at people like Bernie Sanders or AOC, they are not particularly influential. Uh, and, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting is when Nancy Pelosi vacates, uh, which is going to be probably sooner rather than later because of that fucked up attack on her husband. And when Biden, you know, when they stop giving the electric, you know, the starter jumps, jump starts every morning. So it seems as if he's still alive. Um, what comes next will be interesting. But people, the hardcore socialists and progressives in the Democratic Party, like AOC and her, uh, you know, her uh, girl gang, like don't have any institutional power. Or any electoral power, so um, that's kind of comforting. Uh, I was um, I was going to point people to Matt just in response to the reader's question. Um, you know, the the real life example, and I think Catherine might have been uh, getting to this, was Arnold Schwarzenegger in California when he became governor. He was a true outsider who came in very idealistically. Matt Welch, uh, you and I wrote positively of the potential for him to be a true change agent in, in American politics, because he was an old time, I'm socially liberal, I'm fiscally conservative. And he was a truth teller. And was it three months, six months within his election? He was finished. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was so bad. But then the other guys, like somebody like Zelensky, you know, in Ukraine, got elected and is actually kind of rising to the challenge. He's kind of a Bullworth type character. Wow! In a so Bullworth e equals Trump. Well, he Bernie, plays the he played the piano with his penis in a in a comedy. That is true. Before he became president, and, that's pretty. And good. it is actually and that's better good than Warren Beatty rapping. Although in some way it may be for exciting. anyone who does I not understand the sort of the popular culture or sort of. Uh, a role that Schwarzenegger was cast in when he was governor, you should go back and read the Esquire profile of him by Tom, Tom Junode uh, from t 2009. Arnold Schwarzenegger is president of 12% of us. That is just this incredibly sort of laudatory, like Schwarzenegger is going to come in there and beat up all the bad guys and just do the, and like be the action hero that California needs in the governor's office piece. It's, it's kind of a fascinating piece of journalism, a great read. I think it did didn't hold up very well as a as a piece of political prediction, but it will give you a sense of how he was seen and how he was portrayed in the press. Yeah, instead of the Terminator, we uh, Schwarzenegger, we got Jingle all the way. I want to confess, uh, having attended the uh, the very brief moment in which Warren Beatty was a possible presidential candidate in 1999. We have memory hold this, but he was given a Eleanor Roosevelt Award at the Beverly Hilton. In October of 1999, and people were like, is he going to run? Is Bullworth going to run for president? And this place was filled. It was probably the most like glittering uh, event I've ever gone to. All these sort of Hollywood people, Stanley Scheinbaum there, the uh, 
ancient uh, ACLU benefactor, uh, Norman Lear was there, a bunch of people, Bob Shear, um, and they're really they're hanging on every word. Is he going to run? Is he going to run? And he gave, he gave a really, really boring speech <laughs> that was kind of like uh, by the numbers uh, Bernie, but without the charisma. Um, and it was sort of like he thought he was being all dramatic and not. But yeah, people were writing uh, credulous articles in October of 1999. So that shows you how the uh, political uh, campaign cycle has. I was Y2K, man. We were, you know, fucking out of our minds. <laughs> we were out of our minds. History. You know, we were worrying about planes dropping History from the sky. History was over and Bullworth was going to be president. Yeah. This sounds perfectly reasonable to me. You know, a great truth-telling movie worth watching, which is better than Bullworth, is uh, 1972's The Candidate uh, with Robert Redford, which is based on the uh, improbable run and victory of John Tunney, the uh, son of a heavyweight champion, Gene Tunney, against George Murphy, who had been a, uh, a Hollywood movie star, uh, you know, who was friends with Ronald Reagan, who was governor at the time. But um, it's about a young, idealistic candidate who runs and wins by telling the truth. And then it has a great early 70s ending where the political consultant who has helped massage, you know, make the message live, et cetera, you know, Robert Redford turns to him and he's like, oh, we're elected. What do we do? And he's like, I don't know. That's like your job. Like, I'm just here for the messaging. And we've had, you know, a series of people. Reagan is the great exception of like a celebrity who, you know, first became governor, which is no small thing, and governed tw for two terms, you know, effectively. You could like him or dislike him, but he got his stuff done or a lot of stuff done, and then the president, but that's virtually never happened. All right, let's go to a lightning round about the midterms. Everyone around the table gets to tell us a uh, single race, ballot initiative, whatever thing that is happening on Tuesday that you find of particular, perhaps idiosyncratic interest. For whatever reason, Catherine, why don't you start us? Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on uh, California Prop 31, where we're going to, uh, you know, protect the children from the vaping. Um, this is something that Reason, of course, has covered quite a lot. And um, it's a real classic example of a uh, failure to think about trade-offs, um, you know, the the numbers are already trending in a more positive direction, even if you are worried about the teens and their vapes, um, that those numbers seem to be going down. And of course, teens vaping or anyone vaping is still far, far better than anyone smoking a cigarette, even though cigarettes are awesome and amazing and they're the best drug and the best drug delivery device ever invented by humanity. They kill you. They do kill you. And so um, we should be making uh, alternatives to them widely available, even perhaps to the children. I mean, vapes for the children is what I'm saying here. And um, that's a sign that your children are not as old as my yeah, children, I know, by the way. I know. Keep going. Uh, this is e easy for me to say with a with <laughs> an 11 year old. But um, the one reason that I've been paying attention to Prop 31 is because it is such a classic example of this like misleading titling and description of ballot initiatives, which like California specializes in, but all states do this, where even if you are an informed voter, even if you have a highly developed opinion on the policy area, when you look at the language of the ballot initiative itself, you're like, I don't know what's going on here. I literally don't know which way to vote to get the outcome I want. This is, I think, like an under an underappreciated problem with taking these questions directly to the people is that the people are voting on some confusing and badly written sentences. I think Prop 31 will probably pass and that will be a shame. Uh, Nick, what is something that you're paying attention to? Uh, so I'm uh, following the uh, Georgia Senate race between Herschel Walker, who is one of these people who, I mean, his reality testing, I don't think he would be let out of most insane asylums in America. Uh, and he's against Raphael Warnock, who is a terrible, seems to be kind of a terrible human being if you look into his past, but is also a terrible politician who's voted for every big government thing that Joe Biden has asked, uh, you know, plus some. Uh, but Chase Oliver, the libertarian uh, candidate in that race, is polling between one to five percent, probably going to cover the spread between these two knuckleheads. And uh, Chase Oliver is a really classic pre Mises caucus LP guy who, you know, walks the socially liberal, fiscally conservative line, which we can get into philosophical debates about whether that's good or bad. But politically, in retail politics, that's pretty good. And Georgia is an interesting state because it's flipping back and forth between people, but it's not 
purple. It really is like there's a lot of red people and a lot of blue people there. So I'm curious to see how Oliver does. And in particular, when you compare him to the Arizona race where, uh, uh, you know, uh, Blake Masters versus Mark Kelly, where the libertarian Mark Victor, who had been polling as high, you know, in double digits in some races, caved and said, okay, I'm, you know, all libertarians should vote for Blake Masters because I talked to him for a while and he claimed to have carried human action around in his backpack when he was in grammar school or something like that. So I see the Georgia race not only interesting because of this red blue, you know, kind of showdown, but also about how is the LP going to go? Uh, how is it how is it going to go going forward? Because, you know, they're under new management. Oliver has been critical of the Mises caucus, but is going to have one of the very best and most impactful, if we're using that word, uh, outcomes, I think, in, in this election cycle. So I'm very interested in seeing Georgia is fascinating for a lot of reasons, not just because it's the site of the alleged Jim Eagle uh, election law. But we might see a lot of ticket splitting, right? Uh, Brian Kemp might might yeah, win governor maybe. over Stacey Abrams, who's a one of definitely is going to win. I mean, he's like up almost uh, you know double digits by most polls, uh, so. and yet Warnock might win. It's just it's uh it's it's fascinating, and it'll put a lot of uh, narratives to the test and kind of scramble them in ways um, that, if it happens that way, would be kind of like a, a hopeful. Uh, for, to me, uh, outcome. Peter, what is something you've been looking at? Uh, in some ways, it's something that I haven't been looking at. Unfortunately, it's another Georgia race. This one is the um, the Marjorie Taylor Greens district uh, Republican representative. She will not be there. There will not be a libertarian on the ballot in that race because the libertarian didn't make the ballot because of Georgia's insane um, ballot access rules, which were designed initially to keep communists off the ballot, but now have uh, turned into um, basically a sort of a, a way for the two parties to ensure that there is no third party competition now. And there was a there was an interesting potential candidate who tried to get onto the ballot, Angela Pence. Uh, she describes herself, Catherine will love this, as an anarchist at heart. Um, she is someone who thinks that America needs more immigration, a smaller government, um, less control over individual decisions. And she says that she was activated in her sort of political journey because she felt like the Republicans were turning toward authoritarianism, but she couldn't bring herself, you know, to pick be, to, to choose either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton in 2016. Hey, hey, that sounds kind of familiar. This seems like somebody who would be a good person to have on the ballot. She wasn't going to win, Angela. Pence was not going to beat Marjorie Taylor Greene, but it would have given people a choice in that district. And I think uh, it would have been a better race had she been in it. Um, she did, however, tweet uh, about a week ago that she has been humbled by the number of people messaging to say that they wrote her in for the for Georgia's 14th congressional district. Um, so people do still have a little bit of a choice, but it's harder because she's not on the ballot. And I think it's a shame. Eric Baim covered this for us over the summer. If you want to, if if you want to read about Georgia's uh, ballot access laws um, and the, how that system was developed and how it is being used now, uh, his article "How Georgia's Outlandish Ballot Access Law Is Protecting Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Two Party System" is at Reason.com. The uh, speaking of uh, ballot access, the one that I'm paying closest attention to, probably uh, election on Tuesday, is the New York gubernatorial race which has only two people on the ballot. Unfortunately, uh, New York also has terrible laws governing third parties. Uh, libertarian Larry Sharp was unable to get on the ballot. It was challenged. Um, the law, underlying law was rough. And then uh, his actual uh, signature collection uh, was challenged by Lee Zeldin, uh, the Republican running. Uh, so there's only two people on the ballot. Uh, and the last like 36, 48 hours of pre-election coverage has been such an absolute freak out meltdown, uh, mostly by Democrats and left leaners at the possibility that Zeldin might be competitive in this race. Um, you can see Kathy Hochul's uh, closing commercials on television are all about how she's going to fight crime the hardest. So that's a different message than she had a month ago. Um, there's going to be a lot of national discussion. There's people blaming Eric Adams, the mayor of New York already, because he's leaning into Cons false conservative narratives about rising crime and, and such like it'll be an it'll be an interesting um it'll have more national implications than most and then it's you know it's my governor so um, i have personal uh skin in the game as well uh and it's a it's a damn uh, toot and shame that uh, there isn't 
a uh, a, a sensible uh, libertarian on that ballot uh, would have been easier. And I just want to say that, Nick, I know that you wrote in uh, yeah. a <laughs> candidate there. I believe I wrote in I, you, man. Uh, I, you know, if elected, I will not serve. But if I have to, okay. um, uh, you will be jailed um, just uh, preemptively. Um, to, to I'm already I've, I'm digging a tunnel to New Jersey. <laughs> In your mind, all right. If uh, Elon, you know by uh, like eleven p.m. tomorrow Elon night, I'll Musk's be gone. A boring machine is there? Yeah, to help hyperloop. You out? Yeah. Is it a slow boring or is it a fast boring? Okay. All right, let's let's get to our end of podcast. What we have been consuming, Nick. Why don't you lead us off? Okay, so uh, speaking of Marjorie Taylor Green, who is another person who is delusional. I mean, these are you know there was a famous. In the early 70s, there was a famous psychiatric paper uh, on being sane in insane places um, where a it, it, where a psychologist uh, had a bunch of grad students go to mental institutions and give vague descriptions of something and then saw how many people were seen as insane. Marjorie Taylor Greene is insane. I think if she was put, if, if a battery of doctors asked her basic questions, they would be like, this person probably should not be operating heavy machinery or driving a car or wielding the So you're the on the side of, of the She's liberal nuts. medical establishment. I am. You know what? Lock her up. Lock her Calm up. Down along there. with violent Jeez, homeless people. You're like people, wrecking sure. the Goldwater yeah. rule here. Just yeah. violating it. Uh, yeah. You know, well, thankfully, I'm not a uh, psychologist, so I'm not bound mm -hmm. by those rules. But um, And uh, Barry Goldwater in 1964, you know, there were reasons There's, to the, worry the rule about was there for it. A but reason. in any case... So uh, I'm, the reason I'm talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene is that I'm reading Robert Draper's uh, new book, Weapons of Mass Delusion, When the Republican Party Lost Its Mind. Uh, Draper is a really excellent journalist who hails from Texas. Uh, he wrote flatteringly of Matt and me in the, uh, the you know, what is increasingly looking like the high water mark, Matt, of, or at least of our term, the libertarian the moment in 2014. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess it is true that when something appears in the New York Times, it means it's over. Uh, but Draper had written the uh, cover story about Rand Paul and libertarians called Has the Libertarian Moment Finally Arrived? Uh, and we're still waiting on the answer to that, by the way, <laughs> I think. But, uh, but we know it didn't arrive at any time since 2014. Um, but this book is a, you know, from a guy who is sympathetic to kind of uh, mainstream Republican conservatism. He opens with a, he's a, a great writer and he opens with a, uh, uh, remembrance of his father who was a conservative Republican in Texas at a time when it was not easy to be a Republican in Texas. Um, just kind of being dismayed as he was dying to see what the Republican party had become over the past five or six years. Um, and it's, uh, it's highly worth reading because the Trumpification of the Republican Party has, you know, destroyed that party in terms of principles. Uh, even when you look at people like Rand Paul or Thomas Massey, uh, you know, people like uh, Justin Amash, of course, have been chased out. But they're, you know, Republicans do not stand for anything remotely libertarian anymore, I think. And that is disturbing as hell. Um, and they are mostly obsessed with attacking leftism. And all kinds of stuff wherever they see it to the distraction of being in favor of things like immigration, free markets, free speech, uh, you name it. Um, I highly recommend Weapons of Mass Delusion when the Republican Party lost its mind. Um, and it, this is not to say, okay, this, all the trouble in the world is because of Republicans. The Democrats have their own problems and they are going to be dealing with that in a big way come, you know, whenever these election results are certified. Um, but the Republican Party, because it's going to win big in the midterms, is going to go on as if like, look at us, we're winning, we're winning, you know, let's keep doing what we're doing. And what they're doing is terrible and often insane. Catherine, uh, what have you been consuming? I have been continuing to work my way through suggestions from uh, podcast listeners in my convalescence. Um, but the one I want to recommend is um, Susanna Clark's novel, Piranesi. Um, you might remember her name. She wrote um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. But this novel is almost entirely unrelated to to that book. Um, it's actually quite hard to describe, but it is kind of a um, fever dreamish other world in which we meet a character who doesn't seem to 
have contact with the world as we know it, but um, maybe once did. It sort of starts out as a like almost Umberto Eco type allegory story and ends up as a dark academia thriller. And um, I really enjoyed it. I found it to be it, like very, very absorbing. And right after I finished it, I watched the Netflix series. Um, or I started watching the Netflix series based on Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind, which follows a very similar path. Um, so basically, you know, say you had some experiences with psychedelics and you were in academia how did that go for you in the 20th century? Like that arc very much follows the arc of this book, so much so that I almost wonder if she had it in mind as she was writing. So if you are kind of interested in how really, really big world changing ideas have no place in the industry of ideas that is academia, um, I I would recommend actually both the Netflix series uh, and this book. Um, and also if you want to just kind of not be where you are, um, this book is extremely transporting. And if you are me with a broken kneecap, um, that was much needed. So Piranesi by Susanna Clark. Peter? I watched the movie Tar, um, the new film by Todd Field starring Kate Blanchett as a superstar classical music con conductor. Uh, the reason angle is that this is about cancel culture or Me Too, and it's been called a kind of a broadside against cancel culture. I think the movie is actually much more complex, much more tricky than that. And it's really kind of a Rorschach test because once you, if you sort of get away from it for a little while, you realize that all the things you sort of think happened that the movie is suggesting that the the classical music conductor here is getting canceled for that you think like oh yeah she probably she probably did that you realize it never shows you any of it and so it's an interesting exercise just in kind of non-judgmentalism and the ways that uh, you know that we can perceive things that are happening just because of how we see a character and a person Kate Blanchett is kind of incredible in it and i think this movie is actually much more about self-creation and self-mythology and whether individual genius exists. Uh, but importantly for me, it's also about music and the power of the power of beauty and great art and the way that great art just kind of justifies itself and what what it demands from us and what it can get away with. Uh, my pick, uh, I would usually do a caveat, throat clear about how the world doesn't need anything new having to do with the Beatles. Um, and I realize that's just not true uh, because the uh, the generation, uh, the successor generation to the Fab Four, um, people like Sean Lennon, people like Danny Harrison and Giles Martin, the son of uh, George Martin, their legendary producer, they keep cranking out really interesting new product that uh, allows one to enjoy a really good band much, much more. And in this particular case, 10 days ago, they released a new uh, stereo mix of Revolver, their classic 1966 album. It's Revolver Super Deluxe or something like that. Let me look at the exact name, the Revolver Special Edition. Um, but people are calling it super deluxe on the interwebs. Um, it the Beatles uh, when they made their uh, and a lot of bands back in the day, the, the dawn of stereo, they would work all uh, on their mono mixes forever, and then the stereo mix would be kind of done at the last minute. If those of us who had crappy speakers all their lives, you could always tell when you're listening to a Beatles album because one thing was always panned way left, and then you wouldn't get the harmony because the your right speaker was messed up. Um, so this thing I listen to, and I'm not an uh, audiophile like Suderman is, um, I don't have big speakers, don't care about that stuff. Um, it is just so different and big and full, and you can't really describe why. It's not like, oh, there's an element I never heard before. It just the whole thing, uh, a great classic album when the Beatles had stopped touring and were now working as the studio was an instrument, um, classic tracks like Tomorrow Never Knows. Tax man, um, uh, it is it's remarkable. Like I noticed it in my chest on the first listen, and again, I'm not the person who who normally reacts that way. And then there's a bunch of great, uh, you know, outtakes and different versions. You could see that the ba Beatles were basically trying to respond to the Birds, Nick's favorite band, um, uh, and uh, and trying to exceed them at the same time, uh, jangling guitars and harmonies and these kind of things. And you could see them work it out in real time. But the actual just remix of Revolver is so great. It's so much better than what was already really, really great. Um, and it should put to rest finally for anyone who actually cares about the drums 
as an instrument. Don't don't ever <laughs> don't ever talk smack about Ringo Starr. That's one of the best drumming records you will ever yeah. hear in your life. It's fantastic. Um, Nick, you the uh, drums on Tomorrow Never Knows are awesome. And it, yeah, it's and it's not just it's it's so bizarre and wonderful and perfect. Yeah, and uh, oh, and, and like one of the uh, outtakes. Um, that wasn't on the uh, album uh, originally, but they recorded some singles, Paperback Writer and Rain, especially. Uh, Rain um, has over the years, you know, it's legendary as being a one of the greatest bass lines you've ever heard. And the drumming is really great, too. Turns out you find out um, that version that we've been hearing forever is slowed down. The version that they recorded with a really complicated, fancy, crazy bass line and really good drums was about, I don't know. Uh, one third faster. So go listen to that. It'll blow your freaking mind that the level of musicianship on these guys at that moment in their lives, it's fantastic. Giles Martin's been been working through the catalog kind of backwards from Let It Be Down Here using demixing technology that Peter Jackson is doing. So he's sort of like uh, on the cutting edge of what you can do uh, with uh, with stereo remix and stuff. And it's just, you know, every year it seems like they're producing something. Last year it was the, the incredible uh, documentary this year it's the revolver thing and hats off to to exploiting the asset and yet making it uh kind of more interesting for uh deep fans it's really great i can't recommend it can i also uh make a pitch matt speaking of the beatles or the beatles second or sec 2.5 generation sean ono lennon's twitter feed is absolutely one of the best things online right now and i hope he doesn't go to mastodon where we will you know he'll never be seen again even as everybody is going there right but uh he's he's a great musician really interesting collaborator all over the place but his kind of musings on politics and culture I wouldn't say they're libertarian per se, but they are not traditionally left wing or conventionally right wing. And he's just great. And he's in the in the middle of a big Twitter stream fight feud right now. So go check out Sean Ono Lennon. He's As fantastic. a big speakers guy, I will just second that it sounds fantastic it, on big speakers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's right. It's it's bigger. It's crunchier. Right. Like it sounds it sounds both more modern and more more of itself right it's sort of it like like uh, the ins like you can it's almost when you listen to it on on great speakers it sounds like maybe you're not quite in the room with them playing in it but you, it's like you're in the, the 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 studio looking through the glass listening through the the monitors right like it has that sort of directness of sound and the clarity of it um in a way that i like revolver is my favorite beatles album and um i've probably uh i've probably listened to it half a dozen times already Nice. It'll also uh, remind you that the uh, obviously the uh, Liam and Noel Gallagher listened to that album five trillion times. Like every single mannerism of every single song is contained in Revolver and the uh, Oasis output. All right, Catherine, wake up. What? You Hi. Can... <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. She just broke her <laughs> so just other to get kneecap out of this. just to feel so something. Now. Yeah. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. Um, uh, uh, tune in next Monday at the same bat time. Uh, for more stuff, I'll be gone. Um, and uh, listen to all our pad padcoosts at uh, reason.com slash podcasts. Uh, Nick, do you have any uh, speaking easy uh, to talk to oh, yeah. about? Well, we have uh, a fantastic uh, podcast coming up on Wednesday with Maj Torre. Uh, that is uh, an interview that was conducted by Zach Weismuller. Uh, and then the Reason Speak Easy for people in New York, the next one is uh, December 1st. And it features Caitlin Bailey, a sex worker, right, uh, active activist who runs a group called Old Prose, has a great podcast called Old Prose, and also does a one woman show called Whore's Eye View. So that uh, go to reason dot com slash events and you can buy tickets for that on Thursday, December 1st. And if you like what we do, please go to reason dot com slash donate. In a couple of weeks, we'll start previewing our upcoming webathon. Uh, and soliciting questions. Not quite yet, but just going to wet your whistle right there. Um, thanks for listening again, and see you later.